What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios. First off, thank you so much for checking out today's content. I'll make this extremely fast, but I need to plug our sponsors that make this show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, by far the most effective and affordable real estate agent website and database platform in the industry. It is the system I use to sell 50 plus homes every single month. Check it out at www.perfectstormnow.com. Our second sponsor is my personal 90 day mastery bootcamp, which is again, my personal real estate agent mentorship program, where we spend 90 days together, 12 live sessions. You get daily access to me inside the program. You guys, we go so extremely in depth. There's nothing that's incomplete about this program. You're going to get all the tools that you need to go out there and crush it inside your real estate business. Make sure to go check us out. www.90daymastery.com. You can watch in-depth videos of exactly what's covered to see if the program is for you. Um, see all the raving testimonials we have from all of the amazing agents and clients that went through the program. So make sure to check us out, www.90daymastery.com. All right, you guys, let's jump on in to today's content. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just strip top badasses that are out there dominating their space, that are choosing not to live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families, as well as have a big impact on others. So today, you guys, we have a special guest on the show, a um, guy I'm really stoked to have on the show, right? So we, we have a lot of realtors, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of real estate investors on, um, and, and, and our, our, our guest today is really all of those things, very successful serial entrepreneur, very successful uh, real estate investor. Investor, um, but he's got a, a, a unique niche that a lot of people don't think about or jump into um, or maybe are afraid of for whatever whatever that reason may be. So our guest today, again, you guys, real estate investor, also a fellow podcast host, serial entrepreneur. Um, his specialty is, is, is investments in mobile home parks. Um, but not only is he an active investor now, he's out there coaching and teaching and you know training people to do these strategies also um, all over the place. So really stoked and honored to have Kevin Buff on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Joshua, thanks for having me, bud. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, dude. So, um, I agree. You know, before we get into what you're doing today, man, because I mean, we, we, you know, we get a lot of uh, investors on the show, but it just seems like the commonality is maybe they got their start in single family, expanded into multifamily and, you know, uh, um, um, and there's so many other niches out there, right? We don't, you don't hear a lot or at least you know, we haven't had in the show and being in real estate for 12 years, I don't hear a lot of people having, uh, um, that are in the niche that you're in. So I'm really stoked sure, to, to kind sure. of hear about how it works and how you're creating so much success with it. But I'm always intrigued in our guest journey that led mm -hmm. them to entrepreneurship in the first place. So if you would wind the clocks, dude, um, how, how did this whole thing start in the first place for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will tell you that before I, uh, before I came on your show here, I, I watched a couple of your past uh, interviews and I was thinking like, how can I get jacked up? Because like, you're high energy, man. So I went and did a bunch of jumping jacks yeah. uh, before, we, <laughs> <laughs> before we started recording. So hopefully I'm high energy enough for you. This is like high energy for me. I'm normally pretty laid back. So I'll try to keep up with you. But anyway, um, I'll go back in time and I'll try to keep this condensed. Uh, I, I, went, I was a pretty poor high school student, like everyone says. Like I did terrible in school, this and the other, but I really was. I literally graduated with a 1.8 GPA. Like I shouldn't have graduated. Like I, I barely made it across the line, and that I was proud of that. But like, what, what do you do with a high school education, right? Um, and so uh, after that, I really didn't have any direction. I went to community college, like I guess all the people that literally still live at home with their parents that graduate high school and don't go away to school. That's what they do. That's what I did. Um, I always had a job. I, I'd always been working since, since the age of 12, and so I was always out there hustling, making money. I installed car stereos before I was even old enough to drive a car. You know, so I was always out there making money, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do with life. And I was a poor student, so I thought that you should have gone away to college. All my friends did, I didn't. And I just got, I got really lucky, Josh. Uh, when I was 19, I was tending bar, going to community college, and I had started dating a girl. And uh, her mom had recently been divorced, started dating a guy. And this guy, he's, you know, 20 or so uh, odd years older than I was. And he was a local real estate investor and uh, long story short, became friends with him, uh, learned a little bit about him and his business. I didn't know anything about real estate, never read a book on it at all. Um, and uh, all I knew is that 
he would stop by the house like in the middle of the day, like in between my classes and things like that. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing here, man? Like you're supposed to have like a real job, right? Like that's just what I thought. Like you're an adult, like you have a normal job, like a nine to five. Like what are you doing here stopping, you know, Wednesday afternoon by the house? And uh, I got to find out that he literally lived off his real estate investments. I mean, he had passive income coming from his real estate investments. And that was really intriguing to me. I wouldn't say that was intriguing enough for me to like, you know, kind of dig at him saying, hey, tell me more, tell me more. Um, but over a period of the next couple of months, him and I got to know each other quite well. And I think for him, he saw something of a lost child in me, like a 19 year old with, with no direction. And um, I look back now and I see what really happened. That's exactly what happened. He kind of said, hey, you know, you should come to this real estate event with me. Uh, it was a boot camp down in Philadelphia. It was Ron Legrand. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him or not. Uh, he's been in this business for like 40 years, teaching how to fix and flip homes. And anyway, he had a boot camp down in, in Philadelphia on how to do that. And uh, David, uh, this is the guy that became my mentor, the guy that introduced me to real estate. He invited me down there. I said, you know, what the hell? I don't even know what, what you do really. I don't understand it, but I'm going to go with you anyway. Um, again, 19 at the time. I went to this boot camp. Saw a lot of other people that were making great money. People that I felt were no smarter than I. I mean, they knew things I didn't know but not things that I couldn't learn. And um, I left that boot camp really with like a, a big fire in my butt to like go out and make something happen. Like I wanted to be this, this, this real estate investor. Didn't really know what that meant yet, but I wanted to be this real estate investor. I wouldn't have passive income like David had. I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted to do during the day and not have a nine to five, right? Because I just wasn't really attracted to me. And so he took me out of his wing for a year and uh, I literally did everything he told me to do. Uh, I would go to his home office at 8 a.m. in the morning. I would run errands with him. I'd meet him you know, at projects. I would uh, help him sign leases, gather paperwork. Anything he asked me to do, I would do it. And I did that for a year. And after that, I bought my first property. I was 20 years old. I bought my first rundown, dumpy, ghetto property in the middle of a really bad part of town, uh, a part of town I still wouldn't go in today, even during the day. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, bought that property, renovated it, and uh, turned it into a, a rental property, made cash flow from it. Uh, refinanced and pulled some money out and did it over again. And, and I really liked it. I mean, like I literally was like, gosh, I made as much money with this one property in you know, four or five months than I'd had in six months of bartending. And, um, and I was like, I, I could easily duplicate this. So that's what I did. I literally focused all my energy um, on becoming a full-time real estate investor. And it took me a year and a half to, uh, to literally quit. I quit school. I didn't, I didn't finish. I finished in AA. I didn't go get my bachelor's and, um, quit my bartending gig and, uh, became a full-time real estate investor. And so fast forward, I guess I'm 38 today. So what, 18 years, 19 years. And, um, that's what I've been doing full-time ever since. Yeah. Love it, dude. So, um, all right. So, so back then, you know, when you first get started, you're, you're, you're having success there. Um, you know, but a lot of people in that space, and I always like to ask this question just because, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but you know, I mean, stock markets at an all time record high, real estate's at all time record high, you yeah. know, corrections are always inevitable. Um, um, and we all know how hard this last crash was. Um, I do. You, you stay, yeah, but you stayed in the game, right? <laughs> and, and whether you survived it or, or thrived during it, you know, yeah. kind of walk us through what, how that went. Like, how did it go from that first flip up until the market crash? And then how did you go out there yeah. and stay in the game even after the crash? Yeah, well, the market crushed me. 2007, 2008, absolutely crushed every last piece of my business, everything I'd built, you know, over a period of, you know, I guess seven years, seven or eight years. And, uh, I mean, I, just like everyone else, I mean, the market was going up. That's all I knew. I mean, all I knew was I was a 20 year old kid, 21 year old. I mean, buying properties, making a lot of money, making more money than I'd ever made before, making more money than my friends and everything was great. Right. I was the smartest kid the, on the block and, uh, and continued doing that. And I actually surrounded myself by very smart, intelligent people, people that had been through multiple cycles. And so I thought I was doing all the right things of, Hey, they're industry veterans, like they've been through downturns before, they've been through this roller coaster ride, uh, they've been through crashes. And so, just really, again, surrounding yourself with smarter people so that you can potentially avoid some mistakes that you would make on your own. And, um, and, and that, that didn't happen, and it, it's no one's fault, but I mean, my own. I mean, and uh, just like a lot of other people that are way smarter than I got caught up in the market, but um, we were down in Southwest Florida, and so a lot of the properties we owned uh, down here, not only did we lose basically all the value in them, so we, I had a, a port, rental portfolio of 122 single family homes, and we had just under 500 apartment units when the market you know, started doing its thing. And um, we had a lot of equity. I mean, we, we bought really smart, man. Like, we really held true to that, you know, don't pay more than 65 cents in the dollar, including renovations on like a single family home. So we had like, on paper, a lot of equity, right? 
uh, you know, the, uh, our balance sheet looked phenomenal, looked incredible, but it was just all monopoly money because it wasn't real because it wasn't in our pockets. And um, the market started correcting and the values basically, I mean, literally within a matter of like nine months, the properties were either break even or they were like negative in value of, of you know, and that was with a big buffer in there. And not only that, but uh, down here in Southwest Florida, not only did we get the value correction, but there was a lot of speculative builders that were building rooftops for this phantom population that just wasn't coming. In fact, at that point, the, the population was leaving because there was no trade jobs available because the real estate was crashing. And so there was this like rooftop after rooftop, these new builders building down in Southwest Florida that started renting these homes out. And uh, we had like this massive exodus from our rental properties because you can literally go rent a brand new 322 for the same price as our 30 year old, you know, two, two or three, one or something like that, you know? So it was just an ugly time. Uh, it went from making positive cash flow in our portfolio to literally writing checks each month to, you know, make up the debt service. And that obviously couldn't last too long. I mean, it just, it, it wasn't sustainable. And it got to the point to where me personally, uh, I made a, it was literally a strategic decision. It was either, I literally try to ride this out with every last penny I have and try to save these properties that are literally worth nothing now. Um, and I don't know how long this is downturn is going to last or I literally keep some money in my pocket and I use it to live on until I figure out when the hell the world's going to come back. Right. And uh, that's what I did. So I, I, I strategically defaulted on about 95% of our properties just cause they didn't make, I couldn't keep up with them anymore. I'm glad I did. Now looking back, I'm glad I did because it lasted way longer than anyone anticipated. Yeah. And, um, it was tough, man. I uh, lost my, I, I can hear the sob story from other people, but I literally lost my own home, my primary residence to foreclosure. Um, my bank account got garnished, very embarrassing point in time in my life. Um, I'll give you this quick story because it, it was very humbling for me because I've always relied on credit, um, always had great credit, always paid my bills. And uh, as they started taking my homes back, I never defaulted on consumer debt like credit cards and I had some really big lines and I always paid them off. Well, those banks started giving little cold feet and they started either shutting off my credit cards completely or cutting down my credit limits to like nothing. I'm talking like from like 30,000 to like 500 bucks. And, um, I was out with my, uh, my, 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 who's my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time dating like three months when all this was happening, I was very transparent with her about what was going on that basically the world was ending for me. And, uh, I was getting my car washed and we we're having breakfast and across the street from getting the car washed, I went over to get my truck. And at that point I didn't have any credit anymore because literally the limits were so small. I didn't use my credit card. So I had a debit card because I had money, I had some money left just a little bit and I went to use it. And they declined it. And what I found out is my bank account got garnished. One of the, one of the lenders came in and garnished my bank account. And um, literally, I mean, it was like a $24 car wash and I couldn't pay for it. They, they literally, <laughs> they, they overdrew my account. And um, I was like, wow, okay, this is real. So anyway, it was, it was a really challenging time to say the least. And um, I can tell you that I, I, if, I, if I could go back in time and give myself some advice, I would have handled it a little differently. Um, I wouldn't have stuck my head in the sand and I kind of did for a period. I tried to deal with my creditors. I tried to work out as much as I could. Back then, banks were willing to work with, with borrowers. Three years into it, they were. A year into it, they weren't at all. It wasn't friendly conversations. It wasn't anything. There was no flexibility whatsoever on their behalf. So, um, I basically just said, you know what, man, I'm going to just put my focus on something else because like, it's not healthy right now to even think about all the bad that's happening in my world with like this real estate because that's all I knew. And um, I'm really into health and fitness, um, really into, back then I was into running a lot of marathons and I do a lot of road cycling and uh, just really into that scene as well, healthy eating. So I started two other completely separate businesses from real estate and said, you know, I'm going to focus my energy on like the positives. I can control my health. I can control my attitude. I'm going to go make some money doing something that is aligned with a different passion of mine and that was health and fitness. And so I did that for two years and didn't have anything to do with real estate at all. Just literally buried my head in the sand. I wish I had going back, I wish I would have actually recapitalized and prepared for the downturn so that I could have gone back in and scooped up all these amazing opportunities that I, I, I did miss out on a couple of years of incredible opportunities. So, um, 2008 cr crushed me, my friend. That, that, I mean, that's the long and short of it. It crushed me and uh, I have rebuilt myself. It's taken many years, but um, it was a very challenging time. And I'm glad I went through because we all learn, right? It's a lesson. It's, it, a good friend of mine, Rod Cleave, he likes to call them seminars. You know, life experiences are seminars. And so that was my big seminar. And I hope I don't go through another one, but I've learned a lot from that experience. So.
Yeah, love it, man. Love it, dude. Yeah, it, it, and you're right. You know, the, the, those hard moments, if we allow it to be so, it, they become our greatest assets, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're you're going to be so much more prepared for, because it's never if the market's going to correct or crash. It's just right. a matter of when, you know, right? So, um, um, but with that being said, dude, I mean, you go from, you know, top of the world, tons of money, 600 plus units, counting the apartment units, you know, right? Um, to, to losing it all. And I know that you had the health and fitness sector, but most people like in a situation like that, like it just crushes them, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and they, they can't recover from it. Do you think it was the, the health and fitness focus that allowed to keep you moving forward or, or were there other things that you did to, so you didn't allow it to just fully break you? You know, it's, it's funny you ask that question because myself and my two other partners, we, um, we've been working really hard on like our internal, um, uh, you know, we, we have a mission statement, but we've been, we always refine, we're not necessarily refining it, but we, we refine, you know, um, and make sure that we're always on the right path and, uh, and, and, and uh, readjust when we might be sliding off that path of like, we just want to do good in this world. And so, and we want to be able to, um, to help others, you know, uh, achieve the American dream through home ownership. So, so like we're, we're all po- positivity. So like if something negative happens, we try to stir positive back into it. And, uh, we, I don't know how we got on that subject, but one of my partners asked me, he said, Kevin, he's, and I didn't know him back then. He said, what, what did you do? You know, how, how did you handle that time? Like emotionally, you know, how'd you handle that time emotionally? How'd you work through it? And what I, thinking back to it, there was, I couldn't control what was happening with the market. Like I had no control over, I, I literally couldn't make the values come back up. I couldn't make my cash flows come back in. I couldn't change, I couldn't change my bad credit that I now had. I couldn't change any of that. The only thing I could change or control was me. And so at that point I was pretty healthy then. Like I, I wasn't, I, you know, I worked, I probably go to gym three or four times a week. I did a lot of cardio and things like that. I ate pretty well. I mean, still had some junk stuff here and there, but that was, I, I literally put a turbo boost on my health and fitness because that's the one thing I could control. And so that was probably the healthiest point of my life. There was like a two and a half year period of time where it was literally the healthiest point of my life that I've ever gone through. And I'm still healthy today, but I focus 100% on my health and my fitness and fitness and also those businesses that revolved around that. So um, it helped me get through that time because it, you know, as you know, you work out, I can tell that you, you do a lot of, um, a lot of workouts and stuff. And you're really in health and fitness is the, the clarity that you get by eating clean, by having a uh, consistent workout schedule and just treating your body like a kingdom. It's, it's amazing. Like the difference of like eating shitty and, and sleeping in and, and, um, being around negative people and not eating healthy and things like that. Um, it fogs your memory, it fogs your mind you can't think straight. And so I was already in a bad point in my life. Why make it worse? And so that was a way for me to like counterbalance that all. So it was, it was interesting. I, and I never really thought of it at that point in time. That's what I was doing. But now that I look back, it's kind of like you see like drug addicts that turn into like ultra marathoners, right? They were heroin addicts for, for 10 years and now they run like hundred mile races and that's all they do is run. And at that point in my life, it was all I did was, you know, focus on my health and fitness and that got, got me through it. Love it, man. So then at what point did you get, um, regain the confidence to jump back in, man? Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you yeah. must've always like still had this, this itch for it, right? Cause you got these other successful companies, but then you decide to jump back into the game. Yeah. I can tell you that I never made as much from those other companies. They, they were profitable companies, but it wasn't like anything like I had in real estate. And at that point in my life, I didn't really care anyway. Like it wasn't really a money thing for me. It was just something that could bring me peace and enjoyment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, as we worked through that challenging time, but it got to the point where I was like, you know what, like I have a passion for these two businesses and they're fun and they're great and they're dandy, but like, I don't have enough of a passion to pour my heart and energy into them to give them to where they could really be. And I'm never going to, you know, get back to where I was then if I don't have the, you know, the passion to do that in these two businesses. So, um, and I really say it was always nagging at me. And it, the challenge I had uh, in getting my confidence back was the fact that my credit had been crushed. I mean, like, so not only was it just like a bad credit score, but I had this judgments out the butt. I mean, like it was, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I just, they just get tacked on. I'd get a letter in the mail one day and be like, another, oh, here's another $800,000 judgment. Oh gosh. And so like, how do you go get financing? How do you even get restarted when like, what had happened years ago was still cascading down because it wasn't just like it happened overnight and it was over. It was like, it's still like, there's still little bits and pieces that like come to haunt me. And this is many years ago now. I mean, you're talking like nine, 10 years ago. And, um, so, but it got to the point to where I was like, I knew I had to do something different. I had to get some, uh, I had to get back in real estate. I was passing up opportunities. I was seeing people that are still in the business that were, that were just making money. And, um, 
I looked back, here's what happened. I, I looked back on my business and I realized what worked and what didn't work. That was the first thing I did. I did a, a, a very internal reflection point in time where I looked back at my business and said, what really failed? And what I realized is failed for me, and this is nothing against single family homes. This is just my opinion of it. That part of my business brought it down way faster than, um, than, than what it would have come down if, if at all, if it was just apartment buildings. My apartment buildings actually maintain the market. They, they, they sustain through the downturn, but we had to sell them at the downturn because we needed money really bad. So we didn't really make much money on them. We were a completely wrong time to sell. But the single family homes were inefficient to manage. Um, they were time consuming. It was really challenging to scale. It took a lot of time and energy to, to, to buy a large portfolio of single family homes. And it just... I could get there a lot faster with multifamily. And so I knew that I was going to get back into the multifamily game. Like I wasn't even going to buy another single family home. And so my challenge at that point was credit. Like, how am I going to get through this credit challenge? Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get a bank loan? Bank loans were harder than ever to get in 2010 and 2011. Your credit had dried up for a period of years. And so, um, I just went out and started talking to everyone I could about, uh, about what they were doing at this point in time, how they'd gotten through the downturn. And then along the way, I met multiple people that had still had good credit, still were making deals happen. And so I realized that, you know what, as long as I can find deals, I'm good at that. Like I'm, I know that I can find deals. I might have really terrible credit, but I've also got a story and there's way smarter people than me that got hurt in that downturn. So I started like pumping myself up saying, you know what, man, plenty of other people are way smarter than I that, that lost their credit, lost all their income and wealth during this point in time. So like, why am I down on myself? I got a story. There's a reason behind it. I'm not just an irresponsible young kid that lost his real estate. Like the, the market, the market happened and it happened. Now we're past it and let's move on. And so I was able to basically persuade um, others that, that were still doing well to potentially partner, you know, partner with me on deals. And so that, that's kind of how I got my foot back in the door. And that's kind of what led me to mobile home parks. Um, uh, our first couple of mobile home parks, we actually brought a partner and that literally put up his credit, put up his name, put up his uh, uh, reputation to help us get financing on the first couple of parks that we purchased. So um, that really gave me the confidence. Getting my first next deal done, like the second time around, was the confidence booster I needed. It was really challenging. But as soon as I got that first deal done, the second time around, my second phase, here we go, buddy. We're, we're back on fire. Like it just, it felt so good. It was like this, this drug that I hadn't tasted in like nine years, you know, like we're, we're back in this, we're back in a big way. We're moving forward. So that, that's really what got my confidence back, man. It's, it's just someone believed in me and also me believing in myself. Those are the two big things. Yep. Yep. Awesome, man. So, um, all right. So then with, with the mobile homes, you know, cause before, you know, doing this reflection, it was like, Hey, we're going to go into multifamily. Um, it, I mean, it, it just would have seemed that your, your focus would have been, Hey, how do I find deals on apartment mm -hmm. buildings? How, how did, the, how, how did you even discover, you know, the, this niche that now has become a huge niche of yours? In mobile home? It's, it's a great question um, because it's definitely one that I knew of, but I never paid any attention to it. I never had to even evaluated the mobile home park, but through this journey of getting to talk to all the others that were still in the business at that point in time, like we're talking like 2000, late 2010, 2011. Um, I was talking to everyone I could, I'd have lunch with everyone I could that was local, that owned apartment buildings that, that was in this space. And a mutual friend introduced me to a guy that had been in the manufacturing housing space for 30 years. He was in the financing side for like 20, I think 23 plus years. And then um, once he retired from the bank, he was older, he retired and he started buying mobile home and RV parks here in Florida and was doing incredibly well at it. And he's like, you know, you need to go have lunch with Randy. I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm down to meet whoever. And so I met, met with Randy, didn't even know what to expect. I didn't go into me thing saying, I've heard mobile home parks are great. I can't wait to learn from this guy. It was just like a, hey, let's meet for lunch. You're local, cool guy. I was introduced by a mutual friend. Let's have lunch. And uh, over that two hour lunch, Randy told me a lot of things about mobile home parks I didn't know. And it really piqued my interest to where I left that meeting saying, I'm going to dedicate one year to mobile home parks. That's it. Because I think there's something to it. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity here. And um, th that was really my first introduction to it. So I just dug in at that point in time and learned everything I could. And there's not a lot of education out there in the space at all. There's more now with us, um, but uh, with us around, but there's not, there wasn't a lot back then at all. And I just, I dug in and it took me a little over a year to buy our first property. And um, that first property did really, really well. And uh, at that point in time, I said, you know what, like I really, I work really well with focus, Josh, to where I can't be like the guy that buys a 
apartment buildings, self storage facilities, single family homes, shopping centers, and mobile home parks. Like I want to be the best of one thing because that's that's how my mind works and that's how I work best and how I'm most efficient. And so I bought the first park, did well. I said, you know what? I can buy more of these. I know I can. And um, so here we are, 2017, uh, six years later, and uh, that's all we've been buying ever since. And that's all we focus 100% of our energy in. It's mobile home parks. Yeah, I think I read somewhere, what's it, like $40 million in, or something like that in mobile home? No, so that that was, uh, I, I, this, that number's actually higher now. It's from a couple of years ago, but that was uh, just overall transaction. I've owned a lot of other commercial real estate and uh, just my single family home portfolio. But no, our our, um, our mobile home park portfolio today is probably valued at about $18 million. So it's not, it's not that $40 million number. That's just transactions yeah. throughout my history of being an investor. But um, yeah, we're just over a thousand, a thousand pads uh, that we have that we own and manage. And then we have another uh, just under 600 lots under contract right now. And uh, just closed on a park three weeks ago, uh, have another one closing in a couple of weeks. And then we have another, I guess, four after that, that are coming. So we're like in big active buying mode right now. We've got a fund that we put together uh, back in March and we're raising uh, uh, $10 million, uh, raised about three and a half so far. And just, Buying away, man. Buying the opportunities while they're out there, and um, it's just a unique industry. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity in this industry that we think there's a runway, and I think that's like a ten year or less runway to where more guys like me are going to be in this business. They're going to take these opportunities and basically run them like a real business and extract all the value out of them to where there's not going to be a lot left for those that get in the space ten years down the road. So we're just trying to capitalize on the opportunity while it's there. And that, that seems to be what's kind of happened with apartment buildings, man. I mean, yeah. it used to be the, the cash and cash returns are so great. And now oh, they're man, it's horrible. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hard. If not, I don't want to say impossible because people are doing it, but shit, man, it, it's, oh, it's such a rat yeah. race. So yeah. what would you say are the benefits? Um, you know, Cause I know a lot of people are just, they may not be able to wrap their head around the benefits of, of owning a mobile park, home park, compared to an apartment complex. So what would you say the benefits are of a mobile home park over a multi-unit? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of them. Um, you know, first and foremost, the biggest one, uh, actually there's, there's multiple big ones, but if you want to compare apples to apples, you mentioned apartment buildings. So it's really hard to give an apples to apple comparison of an apartment building and a mobile home park, even if it's in the same city, same town. Um, but let's say you could, right. And it was the same grade of asset because there's like a five star system for mobile home parks. So like one star is like the ghetto park, five stars, like palm trees and amenities like swimming pools and shuffleboard. Same with apartment buildings. You got a class, which is like high end and you got D class, which is war zone pack heat. Don't go there at night type thing. Right? So if you compare apples to apples, let's take the middle of the road. Let's take like a three star park and a, and a C quality or C plus quality apartment building. In the same markets, based on how we're buying today, based how apartment buyers are buying, our yields are significantly higher. I can tell you that on average, uh, we're, we're getting between 17 and 20% cash on cash returns. And this is normal leverage. This isn't like some like 10% down or no money down type thing. This is like 25 and 30% uh, real leverage down payments. That's what kind of returns we're getting on our, where in apartments, you're lucky if you're getting double digits, you know, with much higher leverage with 80% leverage. So the returns are significantly higher. So that's one big thing. And it, and it all goes back to how you buy. So I'm not going to say like all the time, you're going to be able to compare apples to apples and say, I'll make more money with, an, with a mobile home park than an apartment because that's not the case. It also goes into how you buy and, and what you're buying. But um, on top of that, the, uh, the turnover is much less. So in a perfect world, the mobile home parks that we own, um, we own very little or none of the homes that are in the park. And so these uh, normal single wide, uh, to move a single wide and to set it back up on a number, like let's say a, a tenant wanted to move it and set it up into another park, they'd be looking anywhere between five and $8,000 to move it and reset it back up. And I can promise you the average mobile home park tenant never has five to $8,000 to move it. And even if they did, they wouldn't because that next park is going to be charging the same amount of lot rent. So there's no monetary gain by doing that. And so, once mobile homes go in, they very rarely ever go out. So the turnover is very low. And if you do have turnover, most of the time, the residents just sell their home. They sell it to someone else and wants to move in. And so the lot rent never leaves. Whereas in an apartment, you can literally pack up your bags, put the mattress on the roof of the car and, and drive away in the middle of the night, right? And be gone <laughs> like a ghost. So um, turnover is very minimal. Um, maintenance upkeep is very minimal as well. If you don't own the homes and you're not getting calls about the air conditioners, the roofs, the plumbing, or anything like that, that is the resident's responsibility. And so the park owners being us, our only responsibility is the, the infrastructure. So the roads, the water and the sewer lines and any kind of common area that might exist. Like if there's a clubhouse or an office or, you know, maybe some green space at the front of the park. Um, other than that, 
the residents are responsible for their units and anything that happens to them. So low maintenance, low upkeep, uh, low turnover, uh, superior returns. And on top of that, there's a massive barrier to entry. You know, mobile home parks have gotten such a negative stereotype and stigma over the years. And it's kind of fair that it's happened because a lot, there's a lot of slumlords in the space that just haven't done a good job. And they've let, you know, let, let literally the trash of the earth move in there and they've run bad and they've tried to drugs, sex and rock and roll, all that kind of stuff. And so because of that, municipalities and, and, and towns don't want these things in. So like, it's very hard to get permits to build new mobile home parks. And so like last year, I think there were like six built the year before that there was like 12, but they're actually going away. They're diminishing faster than they're being built. So it's the only asset class in real estate that has a diminishing supply. They're still building every other type of real estate out there. Mobile home parks are not, they're actually going away. So I don't have to worry about buying a park in a really nice market, Joshua. And, and then having you say, I got this plot of land next to Kevin's park. It's 12 acres. I know he's full. So there's more of a demand. I know I can go build my park there and uh, poach some of his people. I don't have to worry about that. The apartment space you do. And apartments are growing up everywhere. So if there's green space, you could probably build an apartment in most markets across the country nowadays. So those are just some of them. Those are some of the big ones that we like. Uh, and, uh, and what really keeps us coming back to parks other than apartments. So now would there ever be any benefit? And I don't know if you guys do this at all, but is there any benefit to actually also owning the mobile home itself and then doing seller carries back to the sellers? And, mm-hmm. and it just sounds like that can be a great additional, uh, uh form of revenues coming in, but is there other potential headaches with that? I mean, is there, is that something that you've explored at all? Yeah. You know, it's not by choice, but we own probably about 130 uh, rental units and it's only because um, it's probably how we bought the park. Like when we bought the park, it had rental units that we acquired with it. Some owners, some mobile home park owners think there's a lot of money in that business. Um, I will tell you that we're very tight with our numbers and we monitor things very closely and we don't defer maintenance. We maintain things as they should be. Um, we spend the proper amount of money to turn a unit. We don't just band aid things together. Um, and there's not a lot of profit in the rental side of the business uh, above the lot rental portion. Um, you know, these, uh, your typical tenant base, and I'm not saying all parks, I'm just saying like the normal working class mobile home park, when you got renters in there, you're going to have a slightly lower demographic or quality of tenant. Now, not that you still can't get really good people, but um, these units get abused very hard. And um, the cost, if you're going to renovate them and turn them and actually maintain them as you should, being a good landlord, there's not a lot of money left over at the end of the day in that rental model. You can make money, but the, the extra headache that goes along with it, it's not worth it because now not only do you have the extra expense of, of, of turns and, uh, and a different clientele because people that own their own homes have pride of ownership, right? Like they're going to put flowers out. They're going to put flags outside. They're going to actually water their lawn and do things like that. Whereas people that are renting, they're not going to do that. Um, so not only that, but you just got this different, uh, this different tenant base that might actually scare away the, the people that will actually want to own their own home, the people that want to turn it into a community or a neighborhood. So it's not, um, it's not unprofitable. It's just not profitable enough, for, profitable enough for the additional headache that comes along with it. You need extra staff and everything. You know, cause now you're going to be leasing homes on a regular basis, um, you know, when they turn or whatever. So I don't like it. Um, some people do. And I know that there's people actually out there that teach that business of buying mobile homes inside of mobile home parks. Um, and all day, every day, Joshua, I will literally sell my empty mobile homes. If I have rental units, I will sell them to an investor like that and then let them just pay me lot rent because <laughs> yeah. it's much more profitable for me because there's really not much upkeep with just paying, uh, you know, when I got to maintain just their lot, literally I got to maintain a patch of dirt and a water and sewer line. I'll let them handle all the headaches with the tenant. Um, so yeah, I don't, that was a long winded answer. I don't like rental homes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So then with, with the yeah. lot rents, you know, cause I mean, it just sounds like, you know, you're almost like a, a, a glorified HOA, you know, almost right. And, and, you know, if you will, and, and like I know here in Arizona, the HOAs have the authority to foreclose on a home, mm-hmm. but the homeowners delinquent. Um, it, are there laws that protect you in that same manner? Let's say somebody owns the mobile home, but they're defaulted for X amount of time on their, their lot rents. Is there any time, point in time where you're able to foreclose evict them. Well, you can't foreclose, but we'd evict them. Just like you'd evict the tenant out of your apartment, we evict um, th- their home and them off the land. And um, that's a cool, that's another benefit of this business is that, you know, the average mobile home park across the country, if we look, I mean, some parks are $800 a month, lower and some are like 150, right? But if you looked at like the average of our portfolio, they're probably 
somewhere in like the 275 to $300 range. And these are markets to where the average median home price is $140,000, $150,000. And probably the average rent for a three bedroom apartment is $1,000 a month. Okay. So keep that in mind. If someone gets me, if they own their own home, they get behind on their lot rent. That's let's, let's just use 300 because it's an even number. They get behind on their $300 a month lot rent. They're going to be incredibly motivated to figure out, I don't care what they have to do to figure out how to come up with that $300 to pay because number one, they're about to lose the most valuable asset that they have to their name, which is their home, um, and they can't afford to move it, right? Number two, even more importantly, there is nowhere in any of the markets that we own parks to where you could even rent a room for $300 a month. And so like you literally are going to be underneath a bridge or you know sleep on your buddy's couch if you can't figure out a way to go out and scrap together $300. So most of the time, I can tell you that only one instance in all of our parks over the last couple of years that we had to actually evict somebody that owned their own home. So it very rarely happens. They figure it out one way or another. They figure out how to come up with the money because they're motivated to do it uh, because they're about to lose a lot if they don't. And so only one time it's happened. I was in our park in Richmond, Virginia. And um, uh, in that instance, what happened is we basically evicted. We don't even know what happened. He just vanished. We literally checked the local jail, checked the local hospitals. The guy just vanished, disappeared. He lived there for like 10 years. Don't know what happened. And um, it's, it's the same as if someone left like their car on your front yard. If they left it there long enough, you tag it, you give them warnings. Um, and after a certain point in time, you have the right to that property. Like you have the right to actually, there's an abandoned title process that you can go through with the state that you live in. And uh, that's what we do with these mobile homes. So we'll go through an abandoned title process. And then every state's different between two or eight months later, depending on the state and probably a few hundred bucks, we basically become the new rightful owner to that property. And we'll get the title, we'll get a new title issued, and then we'll renovate it and turn around and sell it, you know, most of the time for a profit. And uh, it's a headache to do, but that is a worst case scenario. That's what happens. They would leave, the home would stay there, and then we would get title to it. And then we'd turn around and sell it to somebody else. Yeah. So, and, uh, but I can tell you, this doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. I mean, that, that literally, that, I don't even know what happened to this guy. So it wasn't like a normal instance where he's like, I'm not paying. I'm not leaving. I'm not paying. It was just, the guy just disappeared. He vanished. And so um, that's a, another cool thing about this. But people figure out how to pay. And if they can't, you know what they'll do? They'll sell their home to somebody else or they'll sell their home to us. That's another thing. We'll go and say, look, I don't want to evict you. But we'll always try to work with somebody. Don't want to evict you. Your home's maybe worth five grand. Maybe it's worth 10. We'll ignore everything you owe us. We'll drop the eviction. We'll give you some moving money and we'll pay you X amount of dollars, a fair amount, a fair amount for your home. Like I won't pay them retail, but we'll pay a fair amount for the home just to get them out, sign their title over to us, let them move on and we'll turn around and sell it to somebody else. So that's normally what would happen. Yep. Yep. Love it, man. So then, and I know that this is one of your interview questions or your, your kind of talking point questions. And I know a lot of people have the stigma of the quality of, you know, the, the, I wouldn't say tenant, but the, the person that is going to be buying or, or living in a mobile home park. And I don't know if that's just a false stigma that exists out there, but um, you know, when you do get some of that low quality clientele, like what, what are some of the systems and processes you have in place to ensure that you're successful at managing them? Yeah. I mean, it's just like owning an apartment building or any other type of rental property is just doing the proper background checks, you know, verifying income, you know, um, you know, checking the criminal activity. I mean, so we do that with everyone. So I like to say that we, we really cater to good, hardworking blue collar folks that, that want to, they care for their kids. They want to send their kids to the best schools in the area, but they may only make, you know, 12, 14, 15 bucks an hour. Right. But they still, they're good upstanding citizens and they mean well. Right. And so that's who we typically cater to. Now, there can be the ones that squeak through the cracks every once in a while, but I mean, we do our best to, again, you got to make a certain amount of money. You know, we do income verification, got a certain, a certain amount of money. Um, if you've got a criminal history, then uh, if it was 10 years ago and you got in a bar fight and you got a, and you changed your life since then, um, you know, we'll make an exception. But if you had a, a drug trafficking, you know, charge three years ago, we're going to know about it and you're not going to get into our community. If you had a theft charge, if you had, if you were a child molester, anything like that, you don't make it into our community. In fact, we're very, very uh, open and, and vocal about that, even in our advertising as far as, you know, like here are some of the pre-qualifications, like don't even waste your time if you don't make it past this part, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's how we keep them out. And again, just like in an apartment building, it, people squeak through the cracks and, uh, and, and some of the crap heads get in every once in a while, but they typically work themselves out. When you got a lot of good surrounding like a little bit of evil, 
it tends the good time tends to squeeze it out anyway. So kind of once you most of the properties we buy are distressed. They have a lot of bad elements to them, but they're in good areas. They just haven't been run properly for a long time. Once we actually get them turned around and we show the residents that really do care, that we care, and that we're putting money back into it, and we're trying to make this a better place for them and their family, they become like our allies. And I mean, they they, they live there. They have their home there. They own their home there, and most of them want the best for, for themselves and their community. And if there's any people in there that don't feel that way, I can promise you that the pressure is going to be on for them to move out and go find somewhere else to do their, whether it's a legal activity or just carry their negative attitude around, you know? So it starts working itself out after a while. Yep. Yep. Awesome, man. So, you know, one thing that uh, a lot of people that are entering this space may not think about um, uh, until it's too late, right, would be utilities, right? Because you have some responsibility there. So, what are some, you know, things to watch out for, whether it's public utilities, private utilities? I mean, there, is there kind of some things to stay away from uh, doing your due diligence from looking at a park? Yeah, definitely. You, you can get yourself in trouble. Mobile home parks, are this can be a unique animal. I'll just put it that way. And um, there's some parks that were built uh, that were outside of city limits and weren't really near a, a town connection for like water or sewer. And so there's a lot of parks out there in the U.S. that have private sewer systems and private water systems. So water would be well. Uh, and then sewer systems could be one of many things. It could be septic tanks. It could be a what's called a lagoon. If you've ever heard of a lagoon or know what that is, it's basically like a big cesspool of yeah. waste that looks like a green pond that's covered with algae, but it's really not. Um, and then the other would be like a, a small version of like what your town uses or our town uses to process the waste. It's like a small package plant that processes it and cleanses the water and, you know, basically spits out 99.8% purified water. Um, those three systems, those sewer systems, uh, all different, all different nature, all have their own risk associated with them can be, um, a deal killer. Uh, if, if you don't know what you're getting into, they, they can literally be the difference of you making a lot of money or you losing a ton of money if you don't know what you're looking at before you buy a property. Um, and so it's one of those things to where if, you, if you're looking at a property or a park, a mobile home park with, with private sewer or even a well, because there's lots of regulations through the EPA that keep getting changed and passed down that are making it really challenging to operate these parks with these private utilities or making it very expensive to upgrade the private utility systems that are in place that a new unsuspecting buyer might not know about. So just get an expert involved. I mean, that would be my advice. If you're looking at a park that has any type of those sewer systems or a well, get an expert involved and know very thoroughly, number one, what's happening with the EPA and whatever kind of system you have, but also two, um, what's a backup plan if that system should fail and how expensive is it going to be? And can you even do anything? Can you replace it if it does fail? So uh, we've got a park right now. We knew what we were getting into when we bought it. It's in Pennsylvania. It's got a, uh, it had a, uh, the county sewer connections at the front of the park. So it's at the street. We knew that, uh, it had a septic system in the back that serves the entire park. So one master septic system. And we knew that was failing. Um, and we, but we, we knew this in our due diligence. We got engineers involved. We got the cost. We got the estimates. So we knew everything that was going to, uh, that, that was going to entail and, and hooking up to that, that, that public sewer system. And, uh, we negotiated our price accordingly. And so it's a ma like literally it's costing us like $600,000. And if someone would have bought that park, unsuspectingly and didn't know that was about to happen, that would have wiped them out. It literally would have wiped the average person out. So it's a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal and it's scary. And, um, and most cities don't want these parks anyway. And I can promise you, they will not be working with you to help you save your community. They will be on the other side of the fence saying, Oh, just let this thing shut down. Come on, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't fix the sewer system. We want to shut you down. So, yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. So then, um, are there any niches with inside the niche, if you will? Like I know where you're at in Florida and where I'm at here in Arizona, you know, there are, there's a lot of retirees and, and, yep. um, and those, I mean, I go into some of these retiree, you know, active adult, uh, uh, mobile home parks and they're gorgeous, man. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. I mean, are there any niches with inside this niche that you really focus on or, you know, not so much? Yeah. I mean, we focus, all of our communities are all ages, meaning like they're not age restricted, like the parks you were just mentioning there. Uh, in Florida, we have a lot of 55 plus age restricted communities. So you have to be 55 or at least 95% of the residents have to be 55 or older to live in them. Same with Arizona and a few other, the uh, Sunbelt states. Um, that is, we're not opposed to that niche. Um, it's a different niche entirely. It's a very mature crowd, which is good because most of them have money and they pay, but it's more of a lifestyle type community. And those parks, if they're nice, they typically are owned by large institutional players uh, and guys that like paying like four caps on properties. That's not us. And so 
not that we wouldn't like playing in that space. It's just that we can't get the returns that we would want if we played in that space. So we do in some very nice parks that are um, very mature, older um, uh, resident type parks, but they're not age restricted, but still are, I mean, have like two car garages attached to the homes. Some yeah. of the homes are triple wides that look like normal homes. Um, and uh, you know, so, but we're just all ages. So we cater to all ages. We, we cater to those that are older. They're looking to downsize those that were looking to raise their kids a um, little bit of everything, but, we do not own any age restricted communities. And uh, there's, there's some other really weird niches in this space that I don't really agree with too much. Um, there's a park near, uh, near where I live here in, uh, in the Tampa Bay area. It literally caters entirely to sex offenders. It's the oddest thing. I would hate if I, if my home was anywhere near that place, but it's like a hundred space mobile home community. Every home in there is a rental and they've literally chopped up every single like single wide trailer into like three units. I'm talking like tiny little units and literally the entire park is full of sex offenders because they have nowhere else to go. And uh, most people won't rent to them. And so it literally is a community of sex offenders. I don't really agree with that niche too much, but that's a, it's a unique one for sure. Yeah, no, it's crazy, man. But yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, uh, well, yeah, I saw the other day, dude, like, um, there's like a, uh, I was at a, a Darren Hardy event, a mastermind, and he was talking about niches and how, how there's a niche for everything. And it was like a dating site strictly for those that already have an STD and like, just shit, what? Like, it's crazy <laughs> shit that people come up with, but I guess oh my man, there's, gosh. there's opportunity that's... in anything. Right. So, um, I hope that was a joke by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, it was legit, man. It was a legitimate site out there. So, um, um, cool. But uh, but anyway, dude. So I mean, you guys are buying parks all over the place. You're not just you know staying right there in, in your Tampa area. Um, I mean, we're in the eastern half of the U.S. That's that's our our demographic. Eastern half of the U.S. Okay. So what do what do you? I mean, number one, how do you find these? How do you locate these? Um, mm -hmm. And then number two, you know, I mean, what are some of the stipulations that you personally are looking for? You know, to see if you even want to go out there and start the due diligence process and the offer process. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, it's another barrier to entry in the mobile home park space is that like, unlike apartment buildings or, or single family homes or any other type of real estate, you can pretty much go buy a list. I mean, from list source or many other places, you can buy a list of all those properties. You can filter through it and uh, do direct mail or cold call or whatever. And the mobile home park space is very unique in that all the underlying zoning, when these parks were built half the time, they literally didn't have zoning in place back then. So these parks were just built on like agricultural pieces of dirt, industrial pieces of dirt, residential zone pieces of dirt. I mean, just they're all over the board. So you can't just go buy a list um, of every mobile home park in the U S. And so we build our own database. We literally, um, we do a lot of manual level house. We have a team of VAs that, that manually scour multiple markets that we've researched. And literally uh, I'm talking like manually, like, you know, Google earth and literally visually look, cause you can tell a mobile home park, right? If you look at Google earth, you can tell it's a mobile home park uh, from an aerial image. And uh, we've got a database of about 5,000 parks uh, in East, Eastern half of us. And these are all parks based on the size that we would consider buying. And also in markets that we've researched based on incomes, um, uh, unemployment rates, meaning home prices, meaning rents, um, new job growth, things of that nature. So uh, I will tell you that the, uh, the basic criteria of what we're looking for today keeps changing. The parks keep getting bigger because we're a small company. We only have so much bandwidth. And so when we buying, like we don't have any parks in Ohio and like two years ago, if you gave me like a 50 space park that made sense in Ohio, we'd probably look at buying it. Now, since we don't have anything in Ohio, it probably have to be like an 80 space park for it to make sense for us to consider just based on our, our company infrastructure. And um, so 80 spaces is about the minimum that we're looking at. It might be smaller sometimes if we own other parks in the area, about 80 spaces. Uh, really, there's no maximum in size. Um, the largest park we own today is only 131 spaces. So, but we would consider buying three, four, 500 space parks. Not really, there's no maximum cap there. Uh, median home price in the market has got to be at least $100,000, which isn't very high, but it's got to be at least $100,000. Uh, we look for unemployment rates under 7%, um, preferably in the 6% range somewhere. We look for um, uh, stability in the, in the job growth, uh, meaning that there's new companies coming in, but also a diversi uh, diversification of the employment that's there, meaning that it's not just like a one-horse town where it's like one big manufacturing plant and that services the entire area. Um, we also look for a population, like we want the metro, and this isn't big, but we like metros that have at least 100,000 people in them. And that's a small metro, but mobile home parks work in smaller metros. They work really well. So that's just some of the basic criteria that we're looking for. I mean, really, the, to give you like the 10,000 foot definition, we want to be in a market that we can uh, truly state has a big demand for affordable housing that's not being met. And there's so many out there. I mean, most of the U.S., 
has a affordable housing shortage and, and people are not meeting it. Mobile home parks fit that criteria perfectly. And uh, so as long as there's jobs there and there's growth and stability, then it's a market that we'd probably buy a park in. Yeah. Now, if somebody is, is brand new at investing into this space, you know, right. But they're, they're maybe listening to this podcast or something that, you know, they, they really want to um, start adding to their portfolio. I mean, where should somebody start? You know, cause I'm guessing they're not going to start with a, a, a size of a park that you guys are looking for or maybe, but I mean, what, what would you recommend that somebody start? Yeah, it's sort of size of a park to start with. I can tell you the first park we bought was 30, 34 spaces. Uh, um, and that thing we still own it today, it makes a ton of money. So, I mean, I don't know if there, there is a right and wrong, right and wrong answer to that, but a lot of it really um, is defined by what the revenues look like in that park or the potential revenues look like. We have on-site managers that live in all of our communities. And so, we want to know that, um, that we have enough revenue to essentially pay a quality on-site manager to oversee our investment, right? I mean, so if you have a 10 space park, there is a good chance that you probably don't have enough revenue to, uh, to actually have a quality manager, pay a quality manager to actually uh, to manage that park for you. So um, I would say that make sure that you can afford to pay a quality manager, but then also on top of that, um, if the park's far away from me, I see this, this is a big mistake a lot of new investors make. They'll look at a smaller park that maybe Let's I'll give you an example. The, the park that we own in Atlanta, it's 34 spaces, makes a lot of money, but it's close to us. It's not too far and we don't travel there a lot, but if someone from California bought that and they had to fly an air, you know, go and get in an airplane, fly back and forth to where it literally cost them a grand every time they had to go visit the park. They visit it three times a year. And that small of a park, that is a major impact to the uh, yearly NOI of that property, that, those couple of trips. So, I would say in that, in that situation, go bigger. If you're going to buy something far away, go bigger so that that travel cost can be absorbed a lot easier in the larger park that has higher revenues than the, uh, the smaller park. Um, and I'm sorry, Joshua, like the, the lawn guy literally started cutting lawn outside the house. So if you hear lawnmowers, that's what oh, it yeah. is. So my, my apologies. <laughs> yeah. um, but as far as like getting education, like getting started, there's not a lot out there. There's, there's another group out there and they're, they're, you know, close friends of ours. They own a lot of mobile home parks as well. They've been in this business 20 years. They teach uh, like a boot camp on the topic. Um, they have a lot of uh, quality information out there. We also, uh, we have a uh, mobile home park Academy. That's a very intensive type program. It's not like a three day boot camp. It's like a 90 day, um, lots of one-on-one, lots of group coaching, uh, lots of web-based training uh, type program. And then we also have a podcast. Really, I tell anyone, if anyone has even a remote interest in this niche, the first place I would start is like, we literally have a podcast on mobile home park investing. We've been doing it for, I guess, a, like a little over a year now, I think about 14 months. We got like 78 episodes and we're very granular in nature with the topics we cover and it's all about mobile home park. So, either you're going to throw up after you're done listening to it because you're like, no way am I going to buy these parks or you're going to be like, oh my God, I'm absolutely in love. I'm buying a mobile home parks, right? So that, that podcast, before you go spend money on anything, listen to that first and that will help you with your decision. It'll give you at least the basic knowledge you need and, uh, and help you make a decision of whether or not you want to spend your time on this niche. Yeah. Yeah. So what, with that being said, man, what, what's, uh, what's the name of the podcast? Where do they go find it at? Yeah. So, uh, I've actually had two podcasts, but the mobile home park one, it's called the, the mobile home park investing podcast. Uh, they can go to my website, which is mobilehomeparkacademy.com and they can listen to the episodes there or iTunes, Stitcher, um, SoundCloud. You can find it on all those, uh, all those mediums as well. And then, uh, I do have another podcast that I've been doing for like three and a half years. Uh, it's a commercial real estate podcast called real estate investing for cash flow. And, uh, over the years, I've also interviewed other very large players in the mobile home park niche. So there's probably, I think probably uh, six or seven episodes on there where I've, I've interviewed some big, like I'm talking like the top 10 operators in the US um, in this niche. And so again, you can learn a lot from those, that show, the shows on that podcast, as well as the one that's specific to mobile home park investing. Awesome. And then if uh, somebody's interested in learning more about your, your 90 day academy that you have, um, you know, where, where's the best place to go do that at? Yep. Mobilehomeparkacademy.com. Okay. They can, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's actually a free like two hour training that we put together on there that we go through some uh, high level topics of how we build our database of all the mobile home parks, uh, you know, in the U S how we market to them. Like we're really big with direct owner. We do use brokers to buy deals, but I'd say about 90% of our leads are self-generated. Uh, meaning that we literally do a ton of direct mail. We do a ton of cold calling and it's all to our database. So like we're very in tune with, um, 
going direct to owners and negotiating without having a broker involved. Uh, and uh, that works really well and we get great deals that way. So we teach that on that two hour training, exactly how to do that. And then if they have, they want more information, there's some additional, um, I, th- I think like an opt in, they can opt in and get some additional training on the Academy. And then if it's right for them, they can buy it. So lo- lots of good, uh, examples on that website of what they would get inside the Academy if they wanted to join. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. So I know we're getting long on time. So just a few last questions for you. Sure. Um, when it comes to financing though, for, for these parks, you know, right. Mm-hmm. Cause it's, you know, I mean, it's, it might be one thing to go get financing for an apartment a, building or, or whatever. I mean, is it, yeah. is it, it's is a it, pain in the ass. Okay. I was going to ask, <laughs> is it relatively easy or do you got to get extremely creative? It, uh, and it's all by, it's all a case by case, uh, scenario. I mean, the really nice parks, the ones that we were talking about, like the, the senior communities, uh, the ones with palm trees and, uh, that are just really nice. If they're stabilized and they've been run well, uh, they don't have junker cars up on blocks and things like that. Then there's plenty of financing out there for those really nice. And so when I'm speaking to those parks, I'm speaking to like the three and a half, four and five star parks, like the upper echelon of the mobile home park classification system. If you're talking about like the lower end parks, even parks that are in great markets that maybe just have some distress that can be turned around, which is a lot of what we buy. It's a pain in the butt, even with a track record. Um, I mean, I, we were, there's three parks, three of the, of the five or six parks we have a contract now. I've been having the biggest struggle getting finance. And I'm talking like I've pretty much poured myself out to every bank I could. I mean, literally just, you know, selling them the story, selling them the upside. And these things are amazing deals. And um, some banks, most of them just don't get, they can't get comfortable either with the asset itself or they can't get comfortable with the fact that like no one's going to get up and move their home. Like that's not going to happen. Um, they, they just don't get it. They don't understand the niche. And so it's like a, it's like an educational session. Like I have to put the bank on the red couch and say, sit down, breathe in, breathe out. Let me tell you about this opportunity. I'm going to pitch you. So it's, it's challenging sometimes, but there's financing out there. Now, the positive side of that, there's a positive side is that we educate the owners on the difficulties of getting the financing. And a lot of times, even if they, we don't, even if we've never had the, uh, the conversation of owner financing on the phone with the owner, um, and I know it's going to be a challenge to get it financed through the bank, I'll still, I'll still go through the motions and I'll work with every bank I can and I'll document it all and I will keep the owner in the loop because if I'm having challenging getting financing as a buyer, I promise you every other buyer is going to be. And that typically leads to an easy discussion of, you need to carry paper for a couple of years until I stabilize this park that you've run into the ground so that we can, you know, cash you out and, uh, and we can all move on. And so that if we have trouble getting financing, that's typically what the end result is. Uh, most of the time, that's kind of what we lead it into. So. Yep. Love it. And I, I see a lot, a lot of investors get themselves in trouble or at least beginning investors, not necessarily seasoned investors, but um, being undercapitalized in that they don't, like if I have an apartment building, they, they do yeah. not think of, oh crap, I got to replace this roof now or, you know, the swimming pool needs 30 grand of work or now you don't have a lot of the maintenance that a, a big apartment building may have because you don't have some of those same issues. But what would you still say just to, just to, be somewhat conservative to protect yourself. People should have on hand for those reserves. Just, just well, in case. it really depends on the park itself. I mean, um, you know, you're, you're right. If, even if you're not buying, even if you're buying a park that doesn't have any like rental units in it, like that you're going to have to go in and renovate or fix a roof on or anything like that. And all you have is the infrastructure. We just bought a park in Florida a couple weeks back. That was just like that. There was a couple rental units that came with it. Um, but that they're like so small in the grand scheme of things, the roads in this park are horrific. And we're spending like $40,000 on fixing the roads. I mean, they're in really bad shape. Not only that, the trees in this park, it's like a forest that literally hasn't been trimmed back in like 15 years. It's going to cost us another like $25,000 to just literally keep, cut back what's been not maintained for the past, you know, 10 to 15 years. And so you can't just, the challenge with that is like, if you don't put that money up up front on that deal, like we wouldn't have already planned for that ahead of time. I see a lot of people making the mistake of I'm going to buy it and I'm just going to pay for it out of cash flow because that's fine. I've got a job or I've got another income source. I'm just going to pay for it out of cash flow as I can. That takes a really long time. And I promise you, you're going to build resentment for yourself and probably your wife will too against you for the fact that you've spent two years working on this park and it still looks like a, a hunk of junk and you haven't taken any money out of it because you've been pouring it all back into these repairs that seem endless now because you just really didn't nip it in the bud from the beginning. So um, with that being said, every, every park's different. I would just plan to raise, whether you're going to raise the capital or buy a park. If, if you've got limited ca- capital yourself, buy something that you've got both the down payment 
you know, the downstroke for, but also the initial capital improvements. You can, we always set reserves. We always factor reserves in um, uh, moving forward, typically like a hundred to $150 a year per lot is like additional capital reserves, but we fix everything right out of the gate. Everything that needs done gets done and it gets done right away within the first couple of months. So no. otherwise, otherwise it's a never ending hamster wheel if you don't do that. Yeah. Now, when you go in, when you're buying these um, like one star, two star, you know, the, the, the ones that need a lot of work up front, you're trying to turn them around. Once you've invested that cap and turn them around, I'm assuming at that point, one of the benefits is you can increase the, the, you know, pad rent or whatever on each one. Mm-hmm. How, I mean, is that a challenge to go out? Because you've got these people that are used to paying, let's just say 250 and now all of a sudden, boom, you know, even though you've improved everything now, they, you want 400 or whatever. And yeah. You know, I can tell you that we do a lot of market analysis. So we know what the comps are in the area. And I can promise you that those that live in the mobile home park we're buying also know what the other parks rent for, yeah. right? I mean, so it's just, it's common sense. There might be an ignorant person here or there, but most of them are going to know what the other people in the other communities are paying per lot rent. And they know that they're getting a great deal. If you're buying like the park in, in uh, Florida that we just bought, I like to use that as an example because it's fresh. Um, the lot rents were at three fifteen a month. The markets are like four forty five. dollars Now, Granted, our park needs a good bit of work, right? It's been neglected for years, but it's a great park. It's got great bones. And it's just literally the guy just never put any money back into it for like the last 12 years. And that, so it's very easy to fix. We're going to dump about 120 grand into it. It's going to look like a completely different park. And um, in Florida, we have to give them a 90 day uh, notice of rental increase. And so we've already literally within the first two weeks, we're um, basically going and we're we're redoing all the roads, cutting back all the, all the, uh, the landscaping, the trees and everything like that. Literally there's like places in there you couldn't even see, like now you can. Um, we're literally courtesy, we're power washing and cool sealing. Even the residents' homes, like we own like I think six homes in that park total. We're power washing everyone's home, even helping fix them, their skirting. Like we're actually improving their homes for them, cleaning up the debris around the park. And so we're raising the rents to 395. That's a big jump. It's a really big jump. Um, for 315 to 395. And, but with that being said, that park in three months is going to look just as good as all the other parks that are charging 445. And then typically when we give out our rental increase letter, we give documentation um, justifying our rental increase. So it's not just like, Hey, we're just going to raise rents because we want to. Um, We'll give documentation, even provide addresses of the other parks in the area in case they don't know what they are, who the parks are and what they charge. And so, we know that we're always going to stay slightly below what our competitors are. And we know that we'll always have a park that is comparable or even slightly better after we're done renovating it than the other. So like we kind of create like this own, our own internal barrier to entry to where like we don't really have to worry about leaving or anyone leaving. And if they do leave, that means they're on their way out already. It really does. We've never lost anyone uh, because of a rental increase and we've done some pretty big ones, but we've never gone above market. We've always been very fair and we always feel like hey, if we've got the nicest park and we've just dumped all this money into it, and we're going to raise rents, even if it's a big jump, as long as we're staying below what all the competition is, then you're still getting a huge break. Um, we think it's very fair on our part. So and we never lost a person because of it. Now, would you say that mobile home park investing is, is really one of the best ways to, to almost recession proof your investment portfolio? Because I would have to imagine that in market corrections or bad economies, that this type of housing only demand just increases. I can't imagine those patterns going lower. I mean, right. all your research and experience, I mean, have you found that to be true? Yeah. You know, there's, um, and I, I can't tie it back to, I forget who did the study, but, uh, in between like the years of 2007 and 2000, I think 10 or 11 is when they did the, uh, the study, um, mobile home parks had the lowest default rate, uh, as far as commercial loans are concerned. And that's uh, comparing to like self storage, shopping centers, office buildings, industrial and multifamily. They had the lowest default rate. So that's one thing to be said. Um, they do incredibly well in great economies, which, you know, I think we're in right now. I don't know if we're in a good economy or not, but I think everyone thinks we're in a good economy. They do really well then. And obviously they do really well, especially when people, like when the economy goes down, like if they, if it's a dual income household and someone loses uh, an income and they're already living in a C-class apartment or C plus, and you know, uh, maybe they move into a mobile home park, you know? So like it, we're kind of at the, take the trickle down effect of housing of like someone loses the job or they lose income or, you know, whatever they can't afford where they're living. They kind of step down, step down, step down where we're at. Not that we're like the bottom of the barrel. Cause like our places are nicer than most even C class apartment buildings, even some B class, you know, but it is literally the cheapest option of quality housing available. And not only that you get, literally a yard. You put Christmas lights out. You have like normally your own parking pad. You put a shed out back. I mean, it's your own home. 
So it does incredibly well in recessions as well. And when people have to downsize. So, um, I wouldn't say that it's recession proof because nothing's recession proof, but I do know that mobile home parks and self storage do the best of any commercial investment in downturn. Self storage does great because people that have to downsize, lose their home or whatever, they have to, we're us Americans love our junk (laughs) and we love uh, collecting stuff and people don't want to get rid of it. And so they hoard it and put it into a self storage uh, container facility and uh, self storage facilities do great in downturns because of that. Yep. Yep. Awesome, man. So then um, last question for you. I know earlier you mentioned um, after the last market correction, recession, crash, whatever you want to call it, depression, whatever you want to classify that as, um, you said the piece of advice that you'd give your younger self would be not to get in a single family detached and and just to focus on the apartment buildings. But knowing what you know now today, if you could go back to your 20 year year old self when you first started this journey, um, would that be that same advice or would it now be dude, just focus on mobile homes. Like what would that look like? If you could go back to your 20 year old self right now today, what would that top one or two pieces of advice be? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be mobile homes. Um, but I would say just go bigger. Like don't everyone kind of restricts themselves. And that's why they get started in single family. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just, it takes the same amount of energy and effort and, uh, and, and education to learn how to su- successfully invest in single family homes and do flips or whatever you're going to do in that niche as it does to buy a commercial property or a, an apartment building or a mobile home park. And if you really want to get to the point in your life to where it really is a full-time gig for you or that you're trying to replace an income, maybe you're like a high earner or maybe you're a low earner or whatever. You're just trying to like literally create either a second income or replace an income. You want to get there faster. Just go bigger. It, it's honestly, I, 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 people always would say this when I was younger, like it's easier to get larger properties finance. And that just never it didn't make sense to me. Like how do you tell me that it's easier to get a $5 million property um, like a commercial, a shopping center, easier to get that finance than it would be to get a, a four unit you know, or five unit uh, a multifamily property finance. It's just, it is. It's just, so I would have gone bigger and I've gone faster. Um, but more so, I would have focused on multifamily. If I had just told my, and it, it, multifamily can mean two things to me. It can mean mobile home parks or apartment buildings, right? Because they're still both multifamily. I would have said, you know, skip the houses, buy apartment buildings because it's going to help you get to your end goal much faster than messing around buying one house at a time, which takes a ton of energy and just, it's inefficient. It's very inefficient. So that's what I would have done. And that's what I told myself in 2010 when, when I was ready to jump back into the game. Hey, don't, don't even waste your time. Because seriously, it took me literally, and I was, I was, I was single back then. I mean, I had like a girlfriend or girlfriends, but uh, I didn't have kids. I wasn't married. So I didn't really have other than I liked working. Like I enjoyed what I did. And, um, now I've got a wife and, and two awesome children that I love spending time with. I love life work balance. And uh, there was no way that I'd ever be able to get back to where I am today um, by buying single family homes again. It would take me forever and it would be inefficient and be a waste of my time because I can literally put that same energy and scale it much faster with buying mobile home parks, apartment buildings, or commercial property. I think that's just the way to go. That's the way to wealth. You look at all the wealthiest people that are in real estate, that's what they're investing in. They're buying big stuff and they're raising capital and they're just thinking a bigger game. That's all. Yep. Yep. Powerful stuff, man. So those that are watching, listen, I know we end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation truly is just a start of delusion. Information is no longer power. It's taking that information, taking action on it that creates power inside your life. So you can create the life you know you want and deserve. And Kevin shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Take something that you learned, take immediate action on it. And I don't care where you're at, where you're watching, listening this, whether it's iTunes, YouTube's, or YouTube's, YouTube, Google Play, the website, um, Kevin's information will be below <laughs> to, to his two podcasts, um, also to his academy. So make sure to go check those out. Um, and Kevin, man, I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy. I know you're traveling right now and I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy to be here, man. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely, Joshua. It's been an absolute blast, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Yep. 100%. It's been an honor. All right, you guys. Well, thanks again. And we will see you next time. <laughs>